Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, tonight, I've been asked to do two things. Um, let me rephrase that. I've been given an impossible task. When I was contacted by the organisers, they said, please summarise what was going on in 1917 in 10 minutes. So um, that's essentially what I've been asked to do. About uh, two weeks ago, they added a codicil to the back of that and said, oh, and can you talk a bit about changes in the Australian artillery organisation in 1917? So having uh, been given that additional task, I've used that as an opportunity to actually double the time I'm going to take. So hopefully I'll speak for about 20 minutes on this. It will take a bit. If I rush, it's because of the time constraints. How was the war going in 1917? By any measure, political, economic or military, 1917 was not a good year for the Allies. Now, I've picked economics as a start point for this talk because although it's a complex subject, it contributes as much to the war's outcome as does military or political events, as do. Hard as it is to comprehend now, both the British and the Germans went into this war trying to fight a total war on a peacetime economy. Britain only went into a war footing in December 1916 having been surviving on its financial resources and deficits funding to fund their war effort to that point. Britain had also been financing the rest of the Allies, direct payments to nearly all the participants, plus purchasing a war material on behalf of the Russians and the French. By early 1917, of course, they'd spent all their financial reserves and had had to start borrowing heavily from the Americans. In 1917-18, for example, Britain borrowed approximately $4 billion from the US Treasury alone, and that's 1917 dollars, not modern dollars. Unlike the British and their dealings with their allies, the Americans insisted that these loans needed to be repaid after the war. GDP, for surprisingly, increased in Britain, the US, and even more surprisingly in Italy, but it shrank for all the other competent nations. And for Britain, this was just as well, because by 1917, it was costing between three and four million pounds per day to pay for just artillery ammunition and small arms ammunition, never mind all the other costs of keeping an army in the field. The financial position for the central powers was, if anything, worse. Uh, Austria-Hungary had started the war in debt and with a highly inefficient tax system and relied almost totally on Germany to keep it afloat. It couldn't pay for its antiquated, ill-equipped army in 1914, and things got rapidly worse. Germany was second only to Britain in financial power in 1914, but by 1917, with, for example, the British blockade choking its exports, the country was essentially broke and was borrowing from Swiss banks and its own citizens at ridiculous interest rates. It had no obvious means of repaying such loans. In 1917, the German military imposed a command economy on the country, with war production attracting the highest priority, but with all these external pressures, what was left of the German economy was at the point of collapse. It was only saved by Russia surrendering. Financial need was indeed part of the reason for the rather savage peace terms the Germans imposed on the Russians with the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. There was a bit of a two-edged sword though. So severe was this treaty that the Germans had to leave over 50 divisions in Russia to implement it. The second point in my quick global overview is Germany's unrestricted submarine campaign. Germany's 31st of January 1917 decision to blockade the British Isles using an unrestricted submarine campaign was also a two-edged sword. While it did nearly bring Britain to her <coughs> knees, it also so antagonised many neutral countries that several, and most importantly, the United States, declared war. The US entry into the war on 6 April 17 did much to offset the withdrawal of Russia and thus neutralise the strategic gain that the Germans had achieved with the defeat of that country. While initially the US contribution was primarily money, supplies and raw material, it was almost a year before American forces of any significance began to arrive in France, the psychological boost given to the Allies by America's entry was incalcul incalculable. The Germans had considered the possibility that their actions would prompt an American declaration of war but determined that the strategic situation was such that they needed to take the risk. The commander of the German High Seas Fleet, Vice Admiral Reinhard Scheer, argued that Britain would be starved out of the war before the US was sufficiently ready to alter the balance of military power. And so woefully unprepared for the US, uh, was the US for war in 1917 that he was almost vindicated. In March 1917, 25% of all British bound merchant ships were sunk. In the three months June to August 1917 alone, the Germans sank 312 British merchant ships, 
with a total gross tonnage of equivalent to 1,112,000 tonnes. But despite all that success, the strategy failed. While the entry of the Americans complicated and to an extent destabilised the relations between the British and the French, and I haven't got time to explain it here, but in questions I'm happy to do so, at both the political and the military level, it also rather panicked the Germans and encouraged them to adopt, and excuse me for this one, the rather crazy, in my humble view, uh, 1918 strategy of the Kaiserslacht, where they, they basically uh, launched uh, an all or nothing campaign to break the British Army. Um, the net effect of that campaign was to shorten the war. I'd like to run through now the political developments of the year. It can be argued that we are still feeling the effects of some of the political developments that came to a head in 1917, and of course I refer to the Russian Revolution and the rise of communism as a political system. However, it was the military and political developments in 1917 that also helped set that year apart. So that's only for those of you who are geographically challenged. Um, talking about Russia initially, a key to allied confidence of success in 1914 was Russia. While there was success against the Austro-Hungarians, reaching an apex with the 1916 Brusilov offensive, the Allied expectation that Russian manpower superiority would offset German operational superiority was, by 1917, almost extinguished. Russia's interest in and ability to continue fighting, however, started to unravel in March 1917, when bread riots broke out in St. Petersburg, or as it became called, Petrograd. The riots spread to include the industrial workers and then the Petrograd military garrison. The rioters formed the Petrograd Soviet and began to act as an alternative government. The imperial government resigned and the Duma, the Russian parliament, formed a provisional government that competed with the Petrograd Soviet for power and control. On the 15th of March 1917, the Tsar abdicated. Power, however, continued to be dis uh, disputed between the Soviet and the provisional government until November 1917, when Lenin, the Bolshevik leader, staged a bloodless coup against the provisional government and formed the new communist government. During this period of political uncertainty, Russian soldiers did continue to fight, but with ever decreasing interest and enthusiasm. A major attack launched by the provisional government on the 18th of June failed badly, and as a result, more and more troops began to refuse to go to the front. With fewer troops, a collapsed logistic system, and with the troops' morale plunging, plummeting, Russia was effectively, if not formally, out of the war by August 1917, and they finally capitulate on the 26th of, August, of October 1917. Italy. Most people talking about First World War don't think about Italy, but it was a key player in a lot of ways, and it affected a lot of the international, uh, the military strategic uh, decision making. Almost totally unprepared for war, the Italians were reluctant members of the Entente. Caught between their commander in chief, General Luigi Cardona, who saw himself as completely independent of the Italian government and who would have preferred to fight alongside the central powers, and a strong anti-war sentiment in both the government and in popular opinion, the Italian government faced an almost insurmountable problems in the early years of the war. The Italian defeat at Trentino in June 1916 saw the end of Antonio Salandra's Liberal government. The Baselli government then fell in October 1917 after the defeat at Caporetto. As with Russia and France, the political survival of governments was constantly threatened by military failure and by enormous casualty counts. To their allies, Italy looked a very unreliable ally during 1917. And it has to be said that Italian political fragility was more than matched by Italian military impotence or impotence. France, equally as alarming for, equally as alarming for the British as a fragile Italy was the dysfunctional French government. Throughout the war, the French Republic functioned almost as viciously as it had pre-war. In a little over four years of war, the French had six governments. One of these, of these, only one was voted out of office. The others all resigned. The government of Prime Minister Paul Panleve lasted a mere nine weeks, from the 12th of September to 30 November 1917, and the government it had replaced under Prime Minister Alexandre Ribot had itself only been in office since the 20th of March 1917. There was no equivalent in France to the political truce seen in other countries during the war. The socialist left and the anarchists were generally anti-war and always critical of the conduct of the war. And I cut it out because of space, but I'll briefly mention it. The French Minister for the Interior was eventually charged with treason for dealing with the Germans through Switzerland in 1917. Internal upheaval was not the only problem facing the French government, however. 
For the first two years of the war, its biggest political battle had been to gain control of the French general staff and the strategic direction of the war. The French commander in chief, General Joffre, considered the role of the government was merely to supply the army with everything it had asked for and then stay out of the way. After Verdun, uh, political oversight and control was finally achieved and Joffre was promoted to obscurity. However, despite this strategic victory, the politicians were regularly reminded that the actions of their generals at the operational level still had direct political implications. 1917 provides a classic example of this. It was strong adverse public reaction to General Nivelle's failure, I'll talk about that in a minute, that brought down the Ribol government itself in September. In such an uncertain climate, obtaining political endorsement for high risk military strategies, particularly for new military offensives, was very difficult. And it was not until the dominating figure of Georges Clemenceau became Prime Minister in November 1917 that the French government, and indeed the army, returned to an aggressive war winning posture. <coughs> and not to be left out, of course, uh, there's Britain. Um, France and Russia were not the only members of the Entente experiencing political upheaval or changes in the political military relationship in 1917. Herbert Asquith's government, which had run the war to the end of 1916, was a product of the Edwardian world view <coughs> and tended to be a hands-off type of government with little interest in interfering in either the economy or in the strategic direction of the war. Even with the appointment... <coughs> Oh yeah, sorry, I thought I'd lost my yeah, it's all right. Uh, even with the um, appointment of the interventionist and overbearing Lord Kitchener in 1914 <coughs> to the role of Secretary of State for War, political direction of the war was still comparatively remote. All this changed during 1916. In June, Lord Kitchener was killed and replaced by David Lord George. That came out rather badly. He wasn't killed by his own government. He, was a, he hit, a, hit a mine on his way to Russia and drowned. He ship did. Lord George made no pretense of trying to be a military operational commander, but he did challenge the basic national strategy for fighting the war. Lord George's capacity to direct the war changed dramatically in December when, he, when following the resignation of Asquith, he became Prime Minister. However, it's true to say his ongoing difficult relations with his generals caused much consternation and confusion in 1917, and as a result of one of his decisions in late, late 1917, <coughs> nearly led to a serious military defeat in 1918. Um, now, I'm going to put up on the slide, I'll put up a few slides to show chronologically the major events of the year, both on the Western Front, this one, and for those of you who don't remember, we were in Palestine for that one. However, I, I'm not going to talk about these slides at all. Uh, you can read them at your leisure, because I've only got enough time to focus on two key events. Right. Now, the Western Front was the critical theatre of this war. By 1917, the war had been dragging on for three years with no sign of likely victory for either side. For this whole period, the French army had borne the brunt of the fighting and the French High Command had directed the strategic and operational direction and tempo of the Allied war effort. In 1917, <coughs> this changed and the primary reason was the French army was that the French army rebelled against its commanders. Uh, there's my first in my lists. Throughout 16 and 17, French public and political leadership were growing dissatisfied with the French High Command's conduct of the war. In late 1916, the French Prime Minister, Aristide Briand, faced a difficult choice. Replace the victor of the Marne, Joffre, with a commander more acceptable to the Chamber of Deputies, or lose government. So command had become a political issue. As I'd noted earlier, on the 26th of December 16, Joffre was promoted Marshal of France and replaced as commander of all French forces in France and Belgium by Robert Nivelle. Nivelle had won his appointment, uh, he was a um, very successful commander at Verdun. Nivelle had won his appointment largely, however, by convincing French political and military leaders that he could conduct offences uh, offenses without incurring large casualties, which is a pretty big call. Early in 17, Nivelle gets the chance to put his plans into action and he reveals his plans for a massive offence <coughs> to be conducted by French troops in the Chemin des Dames sector. Despite considerable misgivings from the French government, and from a number of his own subordinates, Nivelle launches his attack on the, 20, on the 25 kilometre front on the 16th of April. Despite some early successes, the attack fails. The French did capture several kilometres together with 20,000 prisoners and 147 guns, but at a cost of 187,000 casualties. So his, his claim to be able to do it without a high casualty count was, was clearly flawed. This was too much and Nivelle's reputation was destroyed. On the 15th of May, he was dismissed. Worse still, however, and this is the point of this section, 
Many of the French divisions and soldiers lost confidence in their commanders, and a number of French divisions declared that they would not participate in attacks they considered futile. The French army had had enough. The first of these mutinies had occurred on the 3rd of May, although the French authorities successfully suppressed the news for several weeks. Given the French army was the core of Allied resistance and was still the largest Allied force on the Western Front, this news was extremely worrying for the Allied leadership. The Germans had long regarded the centrality of the French army in, had long recognised the centrality of the French army in Allied strategy and had deliberately targeted it. By the time Haig was alerted to the problem, large sections of the French army had become mutinous. However, I need to explain, the word mutiny is misleading, as the French troops never refused to defend against enemy attacks, but they did refuse to attack. And as a sizeable proportion of the field army was refusing to participate in any offensive action, it was clear that the French army was in crisis. No French army offensives, with no French army offensives to pressure the Germans, this would enable the Germans to give them some breathing room to exploit their victory in, front, in Russia before the Americans arrived in numbers. To its credit, the French government moved swiftly to correct the position. Neville was replaced as commander of chief by General Philippe Pétain in May 1917. Pétain restored order to the army by addressing many of the internal causes of complaint. Unfortunately, he certainly spooked the British by giving some more radical assurances, one of which was that there would be no more, quote, suicidal attacks. The immediate French military position, as seen by British headquarters at the end of the mutiny period, appeared to be defend the status quo until the Americans arrive. While the repair of the French army was occurring, the British understood they needed to distract the Germans to prevent them from exploiting the weakened French army. They also understood, however, and more importantly, that victory needed the British army to take the offensive. And this realisation led to the other overarching factor worth a brief mention. 1917 saw a seismic shift in the strategic direction of the war. British politicians and more importantly British military leaders began to plan and conduct operations in pursuit of British national interests. The Passchendaele camp, for example, campaign, for example, was fought largely by the British for largely British objectives. Of course, in 1918, a Frenchman gets appointed commander-in-chief over all Allied forces to conduct and direct the war, but the British government by this stage is having a very um, uh, significant <coughs> input into the policies. Um, before I turn to the overview of the Australian Army, uh, Australian artillery experience, I thought I'd better put up this slide just to remind you all, as I said at the beginning, that we were fighting a war on the two fronts in 1917 and that progress in Palestine was much more impressive, especially in the last two months of the year, than it was on the Western Front. However, it features only briefly in this talk because it is not, in a sense, politically or militarily significant to anybody except the Turks and, this, and the British who were there. Uh, Okay, that's the wrong one. I'll have to go back to that one. That's right. It's important always to remember, this is Australian artillery in 1917, it's important always to remember when discussing Australian artillery in World War I that it was not an independent arm in any sense. It was a fully integrated part of the BEF's artillery assets. Australian gunners spent considerably longer periods in the front line compared with their infantry or field engineer compatriots. They would often be left in place while several British or Australian divisions cycled through the section of the front they were, support they were supporting. This audience does not need to be reminded that artillery is always a compromise. Greatest effectiveness comes from larger shell weight, longest range and greatest accuracy. All these factors add weight, both to the mount and the ammunition the mount needs. Weight is the enemy of mobility. Recognising this, 1917 saw the British move to group their artillery into three specific categories linked to specific and specified roles. The structure is shown in the third dot point on this slide. And if I can get it to go back there. Uh, where's previous? That one. As you can see, the groupings there. They describe them essentially by um, uh, the, the functioning command that, that could uh, um, assign them. So you've got divisional corps and, and army troops. The Australians obviously were only involved in tiers one and two, although the infantry were frequently supported by the larger weapons from level three. Right, I need to go through again. There we go. Organisationally, the field artillery underwent some change. Given the field guns and 4.5 inch howitzers had complementary roles, and both were in demand by the infantry brigades they were supporting, in late 1916, the three field gun and one howitzer brigade of the division's organic artillery were reorganised into composite brigades, 
with three brigades of field guns and one of howitzers. These complemented and, and worked in conjunction with the new trench mortars that were coming into service. And I apologise for the abbreviation of this, but I, as I said, it was only given 10 minutes originally. Uh, in 1917, in early 1917, in reaction to a new British offensive concept, the last major reorganisation of field art artillery that occurred during the war happened. Uh, yeah, there we go. Given the size of the attacks and the need to maximise artillery support, the British decided early in 1917 to reduce the number of organic artillery brigades in divisions and create a number of independent, and they were described as army, army field artillery brigades that could be assigned anywhere within the core army organisation to support an attack. These new brigades were created from the third brigade of each of the divisions involved. Um, I've already overrun my time. I understand that questions will happen at the end. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. <laughs>